All right, so welcome to our second part of our meetup. Our talk is a database, is a history of places to put your stuff. Which is like way more interesting than it sounds. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> We're making a lot of promises here. So. It, is, it is interesting. It is yeah. interesting. I had fun writing this talk. I hope you had fun writing I this did. Talk. I had a good time. Um, we're going to get a lot of uh, extra content out of this talk. Yeah. This is going to get turned into a blog. and We'll, we'll both give it individually later. But This is how DevRels work. This, Multi-repurposed this content. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is a, a photo of me and Matthew. We're very attractive, <laughs> uh, intelligent, and authoritative developer advocates who take our jobs very seriously. Real serious. uh, as you can see from this photo and my chins. <laughs> um, yeah, all 12 of them. When, uh, when we were showing this slide deck to my partner, uh, their first comment was, uh, wow, your chins look great. <laughs> So, that's being a supportive partner, and that's, right? Yeah, and that's, positive that's what, and everything. That's, yeah. that's what that looks like. Um, um, it's a, it's and, a great photo. And place. again, so I work at Ivan. I run developer relations there. And I work at Dell, uh, which seems confusing. Uh, why would Dell have developer advocates? But surprise, uh, we do. I, <laughs> uh, my job is not to sell you Dell's products. It, it is to fix your problems, whether it makes Dell money or not. And it's probably not going to make Dell money. Uh, that's so. probably the extent of how much we're going to talk about our yeah. employers. Please don't tell my boss. I cannot <laughs> fix the problems with drivers for anything on your Dell, Linux, Sputnik laptop. I, not my problem. What about D-Racks? Not what my about problem. D-Racks? Okay. Not my problem. So, I can tell you whose problem that is. Yeah. Though, but not it's not mine. Yeah. Someone called. Not. Someone called. Not cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's somebody else. Uh, his name is Barton, and I'll give you. I'll give you his cell phone number. Yeah. I'll give you his cell phone number. Uh, anyway, let's rock it into this talk. Uh, so most people outside of this room uh, generally do not give databases a whole ton of thought beyond um, arguing about whether they should be using like whichever two databases are jockeying for like most trendy of the day or for like whatever the like gumball machine at AWS spits out for you because I can't keep track of all of the databases they offer. Um, and that, that's like, there's, there, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Like realistically for the overwhelming majority of applications, um, you are actually fine just like rolling Postgres and calling it a day. And that's not to say that like, there isn't an advantage to choosing the database that is like the most specifically useful for your application, for your data set, for the way you need to query it. But what I am saying is that like, if you just roll Postgres, you will get by until you absolutely have to switch to something else. Oh, like, you can't. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like at first you are fine just rolling Postgres. Um, and that, that, that's okay. And when you look at the mess of options out there, um, it, it is hard to choose the correct thing. And in part, uh, I think that's because it is all marketed the exact same way to you. The, the technical marketing copy for every database, regardless of the way the data is structured or the way the data is queried, it is all sold to you like this. <laughs> High throughput and scalability with low latency. Um, Congratulations! You can now be a CMO of a database company. Yeah, like I didn't, I didn't make that up. That is, <laughs> that is actually copy ripped directly from like five different databases when I was writing like some content for something else eight months ago, and it still irritates me. It's like one person wrote like the absolute slappingest piece of database copy known to man. 30 years ago and everybody has just been like rehashing it over and over and over again since then. It and they're, they're all the best kind of like, how yes. can you buy uh, what's your credit card number yeah. and uh, the last four of your social and your we can database. sell you lots of databases. Yeah, open. I can sell you uh, so many databases. This is this is sort of like how every distillery in Kentucky is the only distillery that was open during prohibition yeah. and they all work right or every buffet in Las Vegas is the best buffet in Las Vegas. Yeah. They all are. And it, it, it really it doesn't matter. Uh, like what what the database is, they are all going to be sold to you that way. Um, it drives me absolutely nuts. Um, these are all of the different types of databases <laughs> listed in the Wikipedia article for databases. Okay, um, I don't know what quite a few of these are. Um, I can venture a guess based on just like the the naming, but 
couldn't couldn't tell you specifically. What I can guarantee you is that they are all being sold to you in the exact same way. They're all saying, oh, we've got high throughput. Uh, oh, uh, scalability. Oh, low latency. Every single one of them, regardless. Uh, and they they are not necessarily telling the truth for your specific application. They're telling the truth for their specific application. And I, I don't think that they're sold to you this way because of like actually lazy copywriting. I, I don't think that's true. Um, I don't think it's people ripping each other off for decades. Maybe like a little bit of that, but I don't. I don't think that's actually no. it. I still want to know what a probable, probable listing is. So I we're gonna follow that up. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, we no. should Google that. Later. That's we the just, one that I think has the best name. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I know. I know. Probable spatial and fine. temporal sound the coolest, but I know spatial is actually stuff like the way Google Maps works, yeah, like, you know, and temporal is is time series yeah. databases. Um, it sounds. They sound cooler than they it, are. It sounds way cooler than um, it is. But the the actual answer to why these things are sold to you this way is because um, if you saw my my keynote this morning, I said that for this talk, that talk too. It is it is true for all of these talks I give. It's because we have been solving the same problem for seventy years. Uh, we we are always trying to scale more. We are always wanting higher th throughput. We are always wanting lower latency. We always want to do more stuff faster so it's just that yeah like this is the problem we have always been trying to solve since the dawn of computing so that's why we're still selling it to you this way it's just that these are the keywords we've landed on for databases specifically because these are the things we need yeah and we're going to tell this story to you with the assistance of a tv show that i have not seen but matt assures <laughs> me that this is uh very funny for people who this have very seen clever it. Yes, yeah yes. yeah i have not seen wandavision i know i should see it but uh, the story... We'll a journey through the decades. A, a journey through the decades. Yes. With, with, Wanda with Wanda and Vision. And Vision yes. with, is it Wanda and Vision? Is that what's called? Wanda it? and Vision, yes. That's the Vision. That's Wanda. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I should watch this show. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, I have the internet. I can okay, fair it. enough. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the history of databases goes much further back than you would expect, actually. It starts... In the 1950s, when we first had like actual computers, the first computer was the ENIAC machine, which was released in 1945. We're not going to talk about the ENIAC. We're going to talk about data storage. Uh, to understand how data storage and organization uh, has evolved over time, we need to understand what it was like at the dawn of computing, uh, and it was that we didn't have it. Okay, like it was not a thing. Um, we're the very beginning of the computing era, we didn't have a way to store data because the machines were not intelligent in any way, right? They were functionally just really, really, really big calculators. Um, and storing data, storing a program really meant just lugging around like huge boxes of punch cards, uh, which looks like this. If you've never seen a punch card before, this is one from an IBM uh, early early IBM series. They didn't all look exactly like this, but like generally, that's that's the vibe. And for context, if you think this punch card shows a program, this no. punch card and probably about eight hundred more are a program. <laughs> right. So you had to have them all. You, you were yeah. carrying like literal cases of box. these things. Uh, there is a very fun photo from the Apollo mission that oh. shows a woman standing next to a stack of punch cards that is taller than her. <laughs> and that was just handling the calculations for the inventorying system for the Saturn V, which we'll talk about later. But anyway, the way you used a computer back then was you showed up with your stack of punch cards that was one program for your appointment at the computer, which seems crazy today, fed it in and stood there waiting and then took your literally printed uh, output. Also, this was before the invention of the dot matrix printer. So, like, the, the printing was not as fast or easy as you even imagine for, like, old dot matrix. I was going to say, when referring to dot matrix, printing is fast. Yeah. That, like, that, yes. that's damning. That, that's very damning. Yeah. So, in the early 50s, things started to change. Um, this is the Univac 1, which was our first example of magnetic tape storage. Um, this was a pretty big deal because it did allow us to, like, write things much faster than with the punch cards, but reading was still a huge problem because everything was stored sequentially. So you had to like seek backwards across the tape. And these these were pretty 
fragile. Um, actually, unfortunately, magnetic cake storage is still used today. Um, I think that sucks. I spent a decade working in um, offsite data backup, and I find it super unfortunate that magnetic tape backup is still a thing. But if you want to pay Iron Mountain for it, they will absolutely fill backup and store your data on tape drives. Um, do not leave one in your car in the summer. It will absolutely melt, and there's no way to verify data integrity on a tape drive, by the way. Um, you can verify integrity on a magnetic like on a on like a platter, but you cannot do it on a magnetic tape. So pour one out for arc serve. Pour one out. That may have been I'm glad you triggering. did pour one out because no. there's like a mixer. That would right be bad. Yes. That would be um that would be bad. Get thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. It would get thrown out. But anyway, not we didn't have to deal with that for very long as the standard because just a few years later, IBM, the uh for literal decades king of uh computers introduced disk storage with the 305 Raymac. Uh, I was going to bring one of these disks with me as like a prop because I do have one, but I forgot it. And uh, they're huge. Okay. So they're like, they're about this big. Um, they, they are very, very large. You've probably seen them in old movies. You've probably seen old pictures of them. Uh, they're, they're big, scary, like gold looking plates. Um, and unlike magnetic tape, the data on disks could be accessed randomly which sped up both reads and writes. Very cool, right? Uh, however, we did not have a system to organize that data. And so that did not actually make accessing that data any easier. Uh, it, it was just faster. It's yeah, not it was, easier. It was faster, but we couldn't really like get at it. You know, It was just kind of um, there. We had only been accessing data and executing programs sequentially. because we, we hadn't figured out concurrency or multiprogramming yet. So, like, as a concept, this was a pretty huge leap for people, and it didn't really go anywhere immediately, which kind of sucks. Until this guy, um, who looks like everybody's, like, cutest grandpa to me, <laughs> um, that bow tie is really doing it for me. Yeah. Um, he seems like a bow tie guy, but this is Charles Bachman, and he wrote the first DBMS when he was working at General Electric. Uh, one of IBM and the Seven Dwarves, he, uh, General Electric was one of the Seven Dwarves. But this was called the Integrated Data Store, um, or IDS. And this opened the door to a ton of new technology for us. It was uh, architecturally pretty damn near perfect. IDS type databases still exist today. Uh, not IDS itself, but databases directly influenced it, databases that mimic its architecture still exist. And um, while they are very, very difficult to use, they are basically unmatched in performance. And you still mostly see them used in like uh, the telecom industry. They're, they're still a thing. Um, a few years later, with some other general purpose databases popping up, but not really a standard way to interact with them, this guy also decided to form Codacil, which uh, standardized programming languages pretty much and this is how we got COBOL and to bring things back to Kubernetes if you would like to run COBOL programs inside Kubernetes you can do that and JJ Askar from IBM yeah. has written blogs and projects about how to do that and there is actually a fair amount of COBOL yeah still in use today ask me who sold uh OpenShift to the uh government oh and you yeah. used to work for banks so yes yeah still still very much a thing I um, learned COBOL when I was at the drive. Did you really? I was serious about success. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, look at you. You're way fancier than me. <laughs> well, that's fair. You're probably using it and don't know yeah. programming it. Yeah, if you have like a if you have a bank account, you're using COBOL. But would would any has anyone else in their life heard someone who knows how to program in COBOL be described as fancy? My dad that was probably thinks he's fancy. Oh, that's fair. But my dad is 70 years old. So uh, I also used my dad as a source for this talk in some spots. So that's um, always fun. That's why I like writing this. But space. <laughs> All right. So in the 60s, we got another navigational database that uh, blew everybody's socks off. This one you're more likely to have heard of if you are a huge dweeb or you ever had like a hyper fixation on space travel um this is saturn 5 rockets because 
we got IBM's uh, IMS, the Information Management System. And this was developed and released for IBM System 360, which I also talked about this morning. Uh, one of the most important computers in, in history. You can go watch the recording of my talk if you want like uh, a longer ramble on that. But the IBM System 360 and IBM's information management system is what sent us to the moon. Okay. Uh, this database system was designed specifically to handle calculations for the inventory for the absolute thickest rocket ship <laughs> anyone in human history has ever built. Uh, this is a photo of every single Saturn V rocket that has ever launched, and it is so cool, and we can't build this rocket anymore, and that is emotionally devastating. But if you ever get a chance to go to one of the various space centers that have a Saturn V, to go look at it, you should, because it's a very cool piece of human engineering history, both from like a physical engineering and a software engineering perspective. Um, it is a super heavy lift rocket. I think the Falcon is the closest heavy lift we have managed to build. And this thing was originally built in the 60s, <laughs> and we're just now able to match it. That's impressive. And that was originally possible to us because of the IBM System 360 an IBM's information management system, a database that was exclusively built to handle this thing's bill of materials. That's, That's a lot of parts. It's a lot of parts. Yeah. <laughs> space. I built the Lego of it. There's a lot of parts. There's a lot. Are there? Yeah. No, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Anyway. All right. So now we come to the 70s. The collars get wider and the databases get relational. <laughs> so... You know, we kind of think about these early, these existing data systems. We talked about their navigational databases, very sequential. And the thing about that was like everything was fundamentally a linked list, right? So you're like, search? What search? That's crazy talk. So enter this cat. So this is uh, Edgar Codd. I like to call him the top gun of tables. This would have been better if I didn't blow it by showing you my Photoshop. But uh, so Codd. In 1970, he wrote a number of papers that outlined this new approach to database construction, which ultimately culminated in this groundbreaking work with a sick title, A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Databanks. Clearly, Edgar's pretty dope titling things not was great. not his not thing. Great. But in this paper, he talked about instead of records being stored in one sort of a linked list like we'd been using and and uh, in Codasil, his idea was what if we organize the data as a number of tables? Each table is used for a different kind of entity, right? And they have a fixed number of columns containing those attributes. Um, if you're not a database person, think about an Excel spreadsheet, right? Sounds maybe not revolutionary, but it was. And one or more of the columns are designated as a primary key, right? So the rows of the table could be uniquely identified, which is this particular record, cross-references, using those primary keys rather than their disk address, which is how it would work in yep. a navigational one, that lets us do queries to join those tables based on those relationships, et cetera. And so, and that's sort of an illustration of, of how relational databases work. So Cod used mathematical terms to define the model. So he talked about relations, tuples, and domains rather than tables, rows, and columns like we might be used to today. Um, so later on, he got actually kind of pissed that the practical implementation of relational databases talked about tables and columns and rows instead of the mathematical foundations. I mean, he looks like a guy who'd be mad about he does. that, right? Yeah, he absolutely does. But he yeah, also sure. like looks pretty rad, even when he's I not tough. I think he looks really cool. He's definitely got like old Hollywood energy. He does. Right? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they were, they were, we didn't have a concept of like object stores back then. So it was like functionally, it was just single words, single letters. They, we, we were mostly just looking at addresses. Like that's it. Before this, it was a linked list. That was fundamental. But that, that's that's all it was. Yeah. Like, and that's why you couldn't do searches and draw, you know, that, yeah, that connection. So this is why this was. IMS, IBM says that IMS was a hierarchical database, but like fun, fundamentally it was a navigational database and you were just pointing at an address that had some chunk of whatever in it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And so that structure was, again, like you said, I think it was a link list list. originally. Yeah. And that was not ideal, obviously. 
So in the early 70s, IBM started working on a prototype that was based on CODs, not cleverly titled, but very descriptive talk, or paper rather. And so this uh, prototype was called System R. And they kind of fussed with it. Oh, now I see why you said yeah. about fussing and futzing. Yeah. I say it in the yeah. talk. They yeah. kind of fussed with it or futzed with it, as you prefer, for a few years from like 1974 to 1979. And then it kind of became clear that there was a demand for a production-ready version of this. So they created a production-ready version of System R, which was known as Database 2 or DB2, of which you may have heard. Now, at the around the same time, we enter our friend Larry Ellison. I'm using a friend. And so, we gotta, we gotta say so Oracle database things. or Oracle as we're normally, not more commonly know now started from a different chain, also based upon IBM's papers and system R. And the Oracle V1 implementations were completed around 1978, but Oracle version two, uh, shipped in 1979, which, uh, beat IBM's DB2 to the market. And so relational database, relational software systems was the original name of Larry Ellison's company before, uh, just naming it after Oracle. So he was a predecessor. Now we all rename our companies after our product because that goes well. Yeah. But it went pretty good a, for Larry. He's a creepy supervillain with an island. Yeah, so maybe maybe that's the trick. <sighs> um, all right. So in 1973, though, Cod's paper was also picked up by two people at Berkeley, Eugene Wong and Michael Stonebreaker, who's this cat up here. So they started this product known as Ingress, and they were using funding that had been allocated for this geographical database project and so starting in 1973, Ingress delivered its first uh, test products, which were used pretty widespreadly until, widespread, widespreadly until uh, 1979 or so. So Ingress was really similar to System R. Uh, it included the idea of using a language uh, for data access that was known as QEL, Q-U-E-L. And over time, Ingress moved to the more co existing SQL standard that we're familiar with today. So... And about 20 years later, Michael Stonebreaker creates Postgres, also now known as PostgreSQL, based on what was learned uh, from Ingress. So like Postgres has been around for quite some time, but we aren't in the 90s yet. So hold on. <laughs> First, we have to make it through the 80s with me and my mullet <laughs> and my pit vipers. So... I'm not actually going to wear these the whole time because they're like <laughs> super dark. Also, <laughs> fun fact, uh, Pit Viper sunglasses come in Z87 safety rated. So these are, while I look very cool, they're also safety goggles. Very safe. So that's important to, to consider. Anyway, um, until the 80s or so, like the, the evolution of databases and computers in general really have mostly been driven by the changing needs of enterprises, right? Like big businesses because you could not really buy these machines. They were very big. They were very expensive. You generally leased them from IBM or Honeywell or GE or whoever, right? You you did not just go out and buy a System 360. You were paying a monthly lease for that thing. Computers didn't really you, exist. What? I was going to say, and you put it in your lobby yeah, so, so you could impress it. everybody when they came in to right. see, you know, your big fancy. Yeah, it was, there, this was like a whole story arc on Mad Men. I was just going to say, and sometimes you might yeah. think that the machine is talking to you and do weird things, but you know, yeah, go watch Mad Men. Go, so, okay. there's a lot of TV suggestions. There's, there's a lot of TV oh, yeah. yeah, Mad Men is great. I just rewatched it, it's incredible yeah. still. Anyway, um, until the 80s, computers didn't really exist in a form factor, like physical size that was accessible to most users. And I'm not just talking about like home computers, I'm talking about like having desktop workstations was not a thing until the 80s. The computers were just too big and like the graphical interfaces often weren't weren't theirs like a lot of times there was not a graphical interface to these things so then the 1980s showed up um and with the most fashionable decade in human history also um not that the way i look is any indication we also got some pretty sweet hacker movies to go with it that kind of helped to popularize the whole desktop computer situation this is a uh this is a screen grab from uh, war games which is excellent if you haven't seen it, but computers were no longer a thing that like took up an entire room and like required a justifiable recurring line item on like a corporate like outgoing payments. I mean, billing. like 
Ferris Bueller, a high school student, could have one. Granted, a rich kid True. from the North Shore of Chicago, but still, True. you know, yeah. it was accessible. Like, regular people did have computers in the 80s, but they were really expensive, so it was, it was still only, like, a rich people yeah. thing. But universities had them more generally. Like, you started seeing computer labs at universities back then, and you started seeing desktop computers in offices. So, initially, a bunch of different like lightweight databases were kind of jockeying for dominance in the market back then um we we did have computer games but largely these were still like productivity tools right uh the champion however in general was dbase 2 um fun fact there is no dbase 1 uh, okay, it doesn't exist. Originally, uh, DBase was released as Vulkan, and it was not available for PCs. It was for like mainframe machines. But when IBM was uh, planning the release of their DOS line of PCs, which were also like immediately dominant in the market, they commissioned a PC port of Vulkan, and the people at uh, Vulkan decided that they were going to call the PC port. DBase 2 because the 2 implied a second and thus less buggy release. <laughs> uh, marketing. Marketing. Um, also, DBase was ultimately killed by a buggy release. It was DBase 4. <laughs> um, so that, that, that didn't like actually play out long term. But uh, DBase was immediately the dominant player in the market upon the release of IBM's DOS-based PCs just because it was one of the very few pieces of professional software that was immediately available upon shipping of these PCs. So just like, not necessarily because it was be uh, the best, because it was the one that was most available, it was immediately dominant in the market. And it remained one of the most popular selling pieces of software through like the early 90s until DBase 4 sucked. And everybody was like, nah, dog, we can do something else. But what was significant about DBase 2 was that it abstracted away a lot of the like kind of crappy parts of interacting with the database that like weren't really relevant to what you were trying to achieve, but are still necessary to interact with it. So when you were using DBase 2, uh, you didn't have to worry about things like opening and closing files. It abstracted that away for you. So you were able to just like There's something about four, because like NT4 service pack four was really bad. Oh yeah, but NT four was. was fine, so yeah. I don't know. I'm I, I, I'm making a connection. We'll find it later. Well, you'll find it. You'll four find is it. bad, except when it's good. I believe in you. Okay, but uh, the fact that this was so easy to use, like relative to its predecessors, it was not easy to use. To be <laughs> clear, like it still sucked, but relative to its predecessors, it was easy to use. Meant that it like immediately nobody wanted to do anything else, and a, a whole industry sprung up around DBase two. So people were building other databases on top of it. Whole companies existed just to like provide services built on top of DBase 2. Uh, the same way, you know, an entire ecosystem kind of sprung up around Kubernetes. That <laughs> happened with DBase 2. It was really, really, really dominant. And nobody was really able to unseat it. Um, so uh, you, you, you do still kind of like see DBase sometimes with like legacy applications, but uh, it's becoming pretty rare today. And the 90s arrived. Uh, I think the music is better in the 90s, but the fashion is like radically worse um, for me. I'm a big fan of the like mullets, bright colors situation. Um, not 90s. Not the 90s. I did not like bright colors. In the 90s. Except no. teal. No, no, no. But we love the brown. I do love a brown lip. Brown lipstick is good. That can stay. But uh, in the 1990s, things start to change a little bit more radically and in a very different direction because the way we think about software engineering starts to change fundamentally. Now, object-oriented programming had been a thing theoretically for a very long time, for decades. Like the 90s is absolutely not the first mention of object-oriented programming. It had been a discussion since about the 50s, right? Um, however, this is when it became dominant, uh, thanks to, um, a man named Grady Booch releasing a book called Object Oriented Programming and Design. Um, I talk about him a lot and it's probably starting to get weird. It's probably <laughs> starting to get weird. Um, so sorry about that, Booch. Um, Feel free to take a picture of the slides and tweet it and tag Grady if you would like. Yeah, he's very active on Twitter. Yeah. He's a blue sky, unfortunately. So he's, he's going to hear about it anyway. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> Object-oriented programming you are all probably familiar with, right? We start fundamentally thinking about our code and the data we're interacting with as objects rather than as disparate chunks of whatever, as tables, right? So we need a different way to interact with the data that we're pulling out of the database. At this point, we don't have a way to interact with it directly that starts looking like an object. Um, with, with like attributes, right? We're not talking about just like a, a lump of thing. We need an object that has attributes and we need to be able to interact with our data in that way. So this is how we get ORMs, uh, object relational mapping tools. Uh, and now these are pretty like indispensable. Like we, we all, if you're a programmer, you have had to interact with an ORM if you are a backend programmer at all, but it creates a sort of like virtual object database within the context of your program so that you can interact with query data in a way that feels more natural to an object-oriented programming environment. Um, it is it is cool and useful, but uh, this is largely Grady Booch's fault. But it, it changed the way we think about databases. It's a good kind of fault. It's a good kind of fault. Yeah, no, he, he gave us a lot with that book. He also gave us the fundamentals of what we now think of today as uh, continuous integration. Uh, that is where the coin was, the term was coined in his 1991 edition of that book. Also the 1994 edition, but first in the 91. So to answer the needs of object-oriented programming, Microsoft acquired an X-Base database. X-Base means a database based on DBase2. Uh, the one they acquired is Fox Pro, all right? And they subsequently built Visual Fox Pro out of it with support for, like, some object-oriented design features. And, like, this was immediately super popular and then very quickly not at all popular <laughs> outside of, like, a pretty small, like, close-knit group of developers that relied on it very, very heavily. And it was a result of, like, the needs of that group of developers. Microsoft's extended support for Visual Fox Pro actually didn't end until, like, 2015. Like, their, their extended support for this stayed live for a very, very long time. Uh, the more important thing Microsoft got out of the acquisition of Fox Pro was uh, something that they used for access. It was Fox Pro's query optimization routines. They took those and they built them into Microsoft Access, which in part killed Visual Fox Pro because it almost immediately made Microsoft Access overwhelmingly the most popular database solution for Windows environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is where I cut my teeth on, on Microsoft Access, actually. So uh, I don't touch it anymore. Um, and you'd have to pay me a lot of money to touch it now. But uh, it, is, uh, it is where I learned it. Um, originally, Microsoft Access was sold like separately, but in the mid '90s, like '95, they started including it as a part of the Microsoft Office suite, and from there, it was kind of just a done deal, just just sealed. So we've now entered the modern era, also known as the era of web scale, <laughs> right? So when we when we think about web scale and coming into the 2000s and the 20 teens and beyond, um, so uh, I'm not going to play this video. Uh, this is the MongoDB as web scale video. Uh, I'm not playing it for a couple of reasons, not the least of it being time. One of them being there's some parts of it that might not be, you know, friendly. But that said, if you can go to that link, you can watch it yourself. Um, but really what this video is, was kind of a riff on people kind of adopting whatever was the latest trendy thing and just sort of spewing out things that they had read. And so there's two people in the video and when saying, why are you using this? And like, well, MongoDB is what this is not a dig at Mongo. This is like, I don't know. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Saying, well, MongoDB is web scale. One of my favorite parts is, you know, he says, look, you would probably just have as much luck as just why don't you just pipe all your data to dev null? And he says, well, if piping to dev null is fast and web scale, then I'm going to do that. Right. So, but when we think about what, what does web scale mean? It's like, this was a lot of what was happening. And while it sounds buzzwordy, it's just the scale at which we were working. And there's actually an interesting, this goes back to your history of InfraCode, but if you think about why Chef exists, Chef exists because Puppet didn't work, because with the, the folks who created Chef were working as consultants for a lot of valley-based web scale, like yep. large web companies using Puppet, and Puppet was not built to handle that scale. So they had to build a system that, that could do that. So this is where we were at, right? We were talking about going from the era of Again, I come from an ops background. I manage a lot of servers, which meant I might have a few hundred, 
in my data center. Now we're talking about thousands upon thousands of machines. We need to be able to, we're scaling so horizontal, everything's kind of changing. So um, before this term, maybe no SQL, no SQL, however we want to say that. So the term originally was coined by uh, Carlos Strazzi in 1998 because he was na he had a project that was called the Strazi No SQL Open Source Relational Database. People really have trouble naming things sometimes, I think. We also know that naming things is the hardest problem in computer science. Um, but so the, the idea of, of Strazi's No SQL Database is it didn't expose using standard structured query language, SQL, or SQL or Squirrel, um, but it was still relational. Right. And it stored all its data as ASCII files and used shell scripts instead of SQL to access the data. Um, this didn't have really anything in common with when we talk about NoSQL today. Yeah. Right. So is NoSQL RDMS is distinct from kind of the, the next level of this. And so Strazi kind of taking a hint from our boy, the top gun of tables yeah. gets pissed off about how people talk about things. And his, although his suggestion is, well, because the current NoSQL movement, Departs from the relational model, they shouldn't call it NoSQL. They should call it NoRel as a non-relational. And we all know that that's not what Do you think he's still happens. salty about that? I don't know. I don't think he was I, that terribly salty. But I, I think I'd still be salty. We should find out. Is he on Twitter? I surely Let's we find know somebody. Out. We get a hold of this guy yeah. for this. So then we think about, usually when we think about the idea, the, the term NoSQL, we're thinking about the lines of kind of in this model, right? Mm -hmm. So Johan Askarsson, who was a developer at Last.fm, he put together an event in 2009 to talk about open source distributed non-relational databases. Um, and th they were trying to figure out, so it wasn't really a conference, it was kind of a big meetup, it was kind of a big meeting. And they were wanting to talk about like this increasing number of these non-relationable distributed data stores, like open source versions or clones of like Bigtable, MapReduce, MapReduce, and Amazon's DynamoDB. So he organized this meeting to kind of talk about it in San Francisco and they wanted to talk about these things. And they were like, well, we have to think about like, what's a brief term we, term we can use as a Twitter hashtag while we're talking about this. And Eric Evans from Rackspace came up with no SQL. It's actually so online that we have like an entire movement and like an entire we have two marketing of them. thing over. Twitter this is where DevOps, DevOps is called DevOps for the same reason. Because Andrew Clay Schaefer was watching uh, a talk from John Allspaw and Paul Hammond at, uh, about, uh, at Velocity. And he was tweeting about it and he used a hashtag. DevOps. That's why it's called DevOps. The other reason it's called DevOps is Agile System Infrastructure it was too long of a name for a conference, so they called it DevOps Days. You should tweet more. That's the yeah. That's the answer. You never know. You may name an, uh, name a movement. Um, but the idea that was funny. Is this term was really the hashtag and stuff was just sort of meant for that meeting, right? It was just kind of a random thing, and uh, it turned out that it spread worldwide uh, with viral advertising, and now it's the de facto name for a whole uh, sector of of data products. So there you go. Um, so usually when people think about a NoSQL database, um, they're thinking about document model usually a lot of times. You think, think, about about, like, think about Mongo, think about CouchDB, um, but there's other models that are NoSQL, like um, when we kind of think about, you know, Redis is kind of a you know, key value store. We're thinking about column databases like Cassandra or React, different graph models. And, uh, but there's a couple things that are generally in common about these NoSQL data platforms or data products. Um, one of them is they're they're not relational, so you know so, uh, joins are yeah, sketchy, and right? Nice. Yep, um, they're mostly possible. they're mostly open source. <clears throat> or <laughs> although I think Berkeley DB is technically <laughs> open source, we just need to throw some digs at, at Larry. Um, they're cluster friendly, and uh, they're schema less, which they actually have a little bit of a schema, so that's you know fussy. Schema less is marketing. Yeah, but they're mostly, they're not a schema dependent. And then they emerge again out of web scale needs. And what we mean by that, again, is when we think about how we scale, about scaling horizontally versus vertically. And again, this is sort of the system engineer and me coming out. But when we think about systems like a Postgres, which, you know, kind of these older relational databases or building a SQL server or something like that, and you need more horsepower, what do you yeah. do? You throw more CPU in it, you give it more memory, you're making a bigger box. But then when we think about departing from data for a second, you know, kind of where we were in like the beginnings of the web scale world and we were like, okay, we're going to scale our front ends, right? So you're like, okay, we'll scale them horizontally. We'll make more of them. Well, then that's the same model as kind of coming to our, our data stores. And again, the idea of scaling horizontally should come naturally to a bunch of people at a Kubernetes conference, you know, so. Um, 
And another kind of way when we think about the difference between the relational databases and these NoSQL ones is the difference between ACID and the CAP theorem, right? So the relational databases kind of are based upon the idea around ACID. So the characteristics of ACID are its at, 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 atomicity, right? So which means transactions are performed one at a time or they don't happen at all, right? Uh, consistency, so we're saying we don't leave our database in a halfway complete state. So if an error occurs, it ensures that it's rolled back. So we have consistency of our data. Uh, I, I is for isolation, which transactions occur independently. So no transaction has access to another transaction. And then durability. So we're saying the changes made to the database through these transactions on completion are committed to the database. Updates aren't lost. That's ACID, right? When we think about the web scale database, the non-rel database, non-SQL, no SQL, we think more about CAP theorem, right? So CAP theorem... Uh, relate, there's three pieces of that. So the C is consistency, um, not to be confused with the consistency in ACID. It's similar, but the difference there means the user should be able to see the same data no matter what node or machine that they connect to on the cluster, right? So we're saying no matter, again, we have maybe hundreds or thousands of nodes yeah. in there. Doesn't matter which one I hit, I'm going to get the same data. So if data has been written to one node, it needs to be replicated to all the replicas. That's the C in consistency or the C in cap. A is availability. So that means every request from the user should elicit a response, right? So if I make a request, I get something back. Whether the user wants to read or write, they should get a response, even if the operation was unsuccessful. So we have the availability. And finally, the P is for partition tolerance. So partition is when a node loses connectivity. It can't receive messages from another node. So now it's been partitioned. And it could be because of all sorts of things. Server crash happens, network failure, all kinds of reasons. So partition tolerance ensures that the system should be able to work even if there's a partition in the system. Cap theorem basically says you get two, right? When you kind of look at how that works. So it's sort of like the fast, fast, uh, was it fast, cheap, good? Yeah, like fast, two? cheap, and good, yeah. Fast, cheap, and good. And if you're interested in understanding more about cap theorem and stuff, um, the amazing Afir um, from the Jepson reports yep. um, basically goes through all the, he, he runs reports on um, all of these different database systems and uh, evaluate some across across cap theorem, and if you really want to get nerdy about database shit, you should like read everything if you're ever writes. Um, cool. So um, this is an interesting one here. Is like when we think about different kinds of of data stores that as they've evolved. So one of them is when remember when cat kind of had that eye chart of all the different kinds. A kind of a database is a hypermedia database, and which so a hypermedia database is one where any word or a piece of text representing an object can be hyperlinked to another object. Um, and there's lots of different ways. So you think about online en en encyclopedia. So like Wikipedia is technically a hypertext database. And the World Wide Web is really pretty much the biggest, largest distributed hypertext database. I really technically, love this. If part. you want to be technically correct, correct, which is, as we all know, the best kind the of best correct. Kind of best correct. kind of correct. Yeah. Um, and there is also one other type of database system you can use. I, I would not recommend it. There's some thought leaders on Twitter that will tell you this I, is a I fine way to do it. Thought that. leader is a super strong word. It is a super strong word, but technically you can use Amazon Route 53 as a database, but you know, I would, despite the Corey says you can. It, it um, would be very funny. But in a way, uh, DNS is a it is. hierarchical yeah, database. Yeah, so. it's a hierarchical database. So, um, I'll yeah. have that argument. We will have that argument. Yeah. So when we kind of think about the things as we've, we've gone through our journey from the 50s all the way through the to the nows, and, and looked at that, it's like, you know, kind of what are some of the things that we have learned? One thing we've learned is that we look really good in Devo Power Domes. Oh, but, that's so yeah, good. That's neither here nor there. Um, so a couple of things that we see as we look through this is everything we do is iterative. It's not original. There's no nothing new under the sun. And we're building upon the shoulders of giants. And we're continuing to continue to go back to the cat's point about everything is about improving latency, improving speed, improving scale. Why we're doing that. Um, you know, otherwise, say everything old is new again, right? These okay. ideas still connect back. And one thing I thought was interesting to, to think about, um, one of my colleagues, when we did, we kind of uh, were rehearsing this. Um, yeah, we did practice. It doesn't seem like it, but it's okay. Um, but one, one of my colleagues who's been, uh, you know, kind of uh, programming with a vengeance since, you know, 1981. Yeah. So uh, was our other, in addition to Kat's father, was our other check. He was like, you know, it's interesting to think about that. And if we look across the history, relational databases really kind of came in a little bit relatively late. It doesn't seem like, but but if you look contextually, it was it was a little bit late in there. It feels like they've been there forever. But it they they like really only held dominance 
for a relatively short amount of time. And we still use operational data stores. Yeah. Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, the Oracle, they still exist. But in order to meet the needs of the way we do business now and that continual evolution, and I think that's sort of, again, going back to Kat's point of the right tool. Like, there's not one. I mean, first of all, obviously, if there's one one thing that would rule them all, then that's just what we would buy. And there wouldn't be multiple things. They all solve different problems and solve different problems in concert. And um, so this is, uh, if you are so inclined, various ways you can find us on uh, the Internet. Um, across various places. Um, I didn't even put her email on here. That's good. Because this cat has pointed don't out, email don't email me. her because... Don't email me. Yeah. I will not respond. Yeah. I will. I, I probably won't even read it. Yeah. I won't even see it's it. It's not It's not personal. It's, it's not personal. I'll see the notification come up on my phone. Anyway. I'll go, oh, I'm going to respond to that later and swipe on it. Uh, also, and I'll forget. Also, okay. I, I, I would, I would, I believe this is an accurate statement. Kat and I are very good friends. She won't yeah. answer the phone right. if I call Absolutely. her. So don't yeah. even do no, that. No, don't call me either. Even, even, even if she texts you and says, I'm downstairs, I need you to let me in, and you call her right away to see what's going on, she doesn't answer the phone. Text me. So, yeah. Text me. I don't, um, want, I don't want my phone to ring. No. Hang on. I need to. There we go. Um, this is, now don't worry. Oh, I know why it says they're not showing up. The thing that isn't showing up is the QR code. Oh. Okay, don't worry. I'm going to tell you where you can find these. So these are some of our references. Obviously, you can't mm -hmm. click on them. If you go to, um, and this was on the last slide, so speaking.mattstratton.com has the slides, and it has also for this talk has a list of the references and such. And then we also just, you know, we like to provide attribution for photos and stuff and such. So Yeah, we had to lift a lot of images that were licensed. Yes. This, and that, I just took something from Corey without asking. It's actually like so. super hard, it turns out, to find photos of some of these like really old oh, machines. That was actually because when we talked about it, you know, one of the colleagues was saying like, could you show like screenshots of what some of these systems look like? And it was like, no, no, <laughs> no we, we actually cannot. I like, mean, you remember if you saw Kat's talk this morning, you were talking about the Atlas, you know, it was like, the Atlas, no, yeah. nobody even knows what it looked like. Yeah, the Atlas is like arguably the most important computer ever built. And uh, it's basically undocumented. And there's like five photos of it. So thank you very much for for hanging out with us, and hopefully it was interesting. Um, we'll be we'll be hanging out for a little bit, and there is still a little bit of time to go over to the F five has their happy hour at the rec room. Yeah, I think that's so we want to ship over there, and uh, thanks very much.